people love saying that America is a systemically oppressive place and that men are to blame and that masculinity is to blame. You know, if you want to be a man, if you are assertive, if, if you're independent, if you display those characteristics that psychologists have associated with men for decades, then you're contributing to the oppressive place that is America. That just isn't true. And it's time that we call that out. And it's time that we say to young men in particular, we need you. We need you to be responsible. We need you to get a job and you can make this country a better place by being who you were meant to be. And we should call men to that. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Muckrake Rake Podcast. I'm Jared Yates Sexton. As always, I'm here with Nick Houseman. Nick, how was your weekend? How was Passover? Uh, Passover was great. I made the, the best brisket of all time in my grandmother's uh, pot from the 40s. I was a little bit worried it was made out of lead, but it turns out it was really light. So I was like, it can't be lead. But I actually did some research, thanks to some help from uh, people on Twitter, and uh, it's aluminum. All right. All right. So disaster averted. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it was a terrific brisket. People came over. We had a great time. Uh, we remembered where we what our what our my people went had de- had to deal with back in the day. And uh, and we're and we move on. Well, so we're, we're going to have on the podcast in a little bit uh, Max Berger from More Perfect Union. But before we do that, we need to talk about another group, Nick, that has gone through some real trials i mean listen you know like some people who have like really really dealt with it and that group of course nick are uh straight white men yes well we're familiar with them we 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 are and 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 before we begin we have to ask are men okay i you know we i don't know if i can answer that question for you right now let's we have to pull us apart and figure it out well we do and we need to talk about masculinity and crisis nick Bum, 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 bum. G- 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 giant music right now. You know, it's it's everyone who runs those stop signs that, that really burns me up, man. <laughs> so we we have this uh, lawlessness. Focus, we have this focus group that we got to talk about in a second from the New York Times. But listen, it would not be the Muckrake podcast if we did not talk about the advertisement that everybody. Well, all the political sickos anyway are talking about, which is a Tucker Carlson original. And you, you've, you've seen this video at this point, correct? I, I have. I have. Could you, if, if anybody at home hasn't particularly seen this, maybe they saw it in passing. Can you can you give it a quick little summary just from your mind? Like, what, what do you remember? of it? Because this is a very uh, uh, engrossing, visceral experience. I it think. is. It is. It's in your face and it is men. <laughs> it and is most doing... definitely in your face. I mean, listen, George Takei described it as I think the, the term was, quote unquote, so gay it's so strange what this thing is and you know we we can have our jollies at this thing um it's really troubling and it is really (laughs) it's really disturbing particularly where this thing is going nick we've got we've got um shirtless men wrestling we've got shirtless men uh uh, picking up giant truck tires and throwing them they're drinking i think eggs oh yeah but you're 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 burying the lead here jim you gotta build up to what eventually occurs after they're shooting <laughs> weapons, after they're planting and chopping wood. And then, as um, as we've already heard in the preview for this show, the spake Zarustra is playing, mm-hmm. uh, the, the drums are beating, and then we see a fully <laughs> naked man up on a ledge with his hands extended, and he has a device that is, and I've, I've, I've checked on this because mm-hmm. we care about accuracy, he is um, sunning his testicles. You know, I think I now know what was in the, um, in the case in Pulp Fiction when they open it and it glows. <laughs> <laughs> I listen. I, I I'm not going to lie to you. I I watched this thing like the Zap Rooter film. Mm-hmm. I I broke it down. I wanted to see everything that was happening because on one hand, and I got to tell you, we're making light of this. This is like some really terrifying stuff. Like it 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 is basically signaling a new level of of fascism that is approaching. But I have to tell you, it is patently absurd. Oh, well, and by the way, just to, just to give some credence to what the guy is doing, you know, it, it, was, it was Easter of all days when I'm watching this, right? And so I'm seeing the guy like, you know, Jesus on the cross with the balls being radiated. I think the, 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 the medical uh, reasoning behind this is that you can increase testosterone 
by exposing your testicles to ultraviolet rays. I think this is really what the medical reason is for. I whether or not that's true or not, I don't know. But Wait, that's what we're he's doing. doing a podcast, and maybe if people are watching on YouTube, they'll see me do this. Let's put some quotations <laughs> around medical. Okay. Let's let's put some quote just to just to be on the safe side. Let's put some quotations around radiating your testicles being a healthy testosterone raising yeah. activity. I mean, it's probably about as medical as shining a light in your you know in your body to er er eradicate. COVID. That sounds probably around the exact uh, same level of things. Uh, I, I, I got to tell you, I've watched the extended cut at this point because oh, wow. I, I would not be um, denied. Uh, it involves Tucker Carlson. And, and a reminder, everybody knows this, but just to set the scene, um, Tucker is a twerp, just an absolute nerd privileged twerp who is spending his time in hungary talking about defending western civilization and in his nasally voice he's talking about masculinity is under attack right and meanwhile showing all this stuff talking about literally radiating your testicles to try and raise testosterone the extended cut it's got jfk nick it's got oh, rockets no. going off in the sky because we got to have some phallus right <laughs> we we've got strong muscular men running here to and fro i, I mean literally talking about the 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 fate of the species and 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 i just keep watching this and on one hand it's so absurd because my god men get your shit together for real this is pathetic but on the other hand that patheticness it breeds really dangerous stuff Absolutely. Listen, I, I'm not sure if I'm even need to talk much because you've literally wrote, wrote the book. On this. I, 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 I did. And, and, you know, on one hand, it's really dangerous when men feel emasculated and they're, they, they overcompensate by grabbing guns or engaging in violence. Um, this is a call to a revitalization, quote unquote, of masculinity. By the way, again, Tucker Carlson, the guy who got super upset about them making the green M&M less sexy. Mm -hmm. Right. Like like basically hosted like an hour of a show because he was so upset that the green M&M was less sexy. I'm going to read um, the monologue, Nick, that uh, that opened this show. Are, are you ready? Because I'm going to do this in, in this weird uh, voice that 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 is assigned to this. I don't know what else to say. Well, please. I, I cannot wait. Once a society collapses, then you're in hard times. Well, hard iron shirt. <laughs> Hard. Hard. <laughs> I gotta get through it. I'm a professional. Hard iron sharpens iron, as they say. And those hard times inevitably produce men who are tough, men who are resourceful, men who are strong enough to survive. And then they go on to establish order, so the cycle begins again. How you feel about that? How does that make you feel deep down in, 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 in your center, Nick? I, it makes me feel kind of like, um, I guess, like dumb. Like it just sounds, it just sounds dumb, and it sounds so uh, unintellectual. I suppose is the word. Yep. It's like, you know, you like to think we're evolving and, and we're improving and we're progressing, and yet this just sounds like Conan, -like, Conan the Barbarian. You know, like the men are be pushing a wine press or something in their loincloths. I was watching a little bit of Conan this, this weekend. I just caught a couple minutes of it. What a trip that is. Yeah. Well, and what if what if I told you that this entire monologue and this entire idea is based on like some real ancient Greek fascistic proto fascistic shit, and that this is exactly what Steve Bannon and other fascists believe, which is that there's a cycle of birth and destruction, and in 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 good times men get weak, Nick, but then when things Things get bad men get tough and then they'll come up from the mire and the rubble and they'll fix things and put it right what if i told you that does that sound about right yeah well it makes me wonder like why is there there's always a very big um you know um what should we call it a uh, a big thing about like the greek civilization in third fourth grade social studies whatever you know it's a big thing and it makes me wonder like what kind of effect is that having <laughs> on our kids is that the new this is the crt for our our side i don't know but like if it's polluting these young boys to think that like they need to be you know throwing the discus you know with no clothes on i don't know <laughs> what's happening but you know what's troubling. weird about uh athens and what's weird about greece nick is that uh you know we we think about it as the height of democracy and mm -hmm. like all these deep deep thinkers and all that do you know how they were able to do all that deep thinking and do all their democratic experiments because it was a stratified society where they relied on slave labor Oh, I thought you were going to talk about how strong the wine was back then. <laughs> no, it was much more about, you know what, there were some people who were able to think and rule, and then there were other people who were uh, kept in slavery. Yeah, 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. And and it's almost like all these people, and I'm sure you've seen them on Twitter and you've seen them on the Internet who have all these Greek statues as their profiles and they're always talking about Western civilization. They believe in this idea of kyklos, is it, which basically means cycles, right? If you want to look this up, if anybody wants to get a little bit more familiar with it, look up the fourth turning. It's the idea that history goes in these cycles and there's like a priest society and there's a warrior society and eventually it's corrupted and all that. This is the basis of Steve Bannon and national conservatism. It's the idea that we are in a downward spiral in this cycle and that only strong, strong, hard men, Nick, they are the only ones that could possibly ever put things to right. So if we're going to sit here and we're going to start, I don't know, radiating our balls and and talking about throwing over tires and being strong, this is all leading to a place where men will say, guess what? If if you're going to put us in a corner, we'll go ahead and we'll take over society and we'll see what happens. Yeah. I I feel like it's worth noting that the slavery that existed back then, uh, like, you know, the Greek Empire didn't fall because enough people decided, hey, we don't want slavery. And they had like a civil war or anything. Right. No one seemed to think there was an issue with that back then at all no Um, some men are born to be rulers and some men are born to be slaves it's almost like natural hierarchies yeah yeah you know by the way but it is you're right so does it make it better let me ask you this uh okay what's his face um not tucker but the other guy on after him um hannity hannity does crab mcgraw or whatever right he like he fights So is it going to make it better wait. if it's like a guy who is like tougher to like to expose all these things or not? Wait, time out, time what? out. What? In the issue of <laughs> in the issue in the issue of accuracy, he sort of does MMA. Like he okay. he will he'll like go into the like I I beg everybody um to go <laughs> and look up videos of Sean Hannity doing MMA and it's just like this little dweeb guy who's like. Hey, boss. Hey, boss. I put on a really good choke, didn't I? And the MMA guys are like, great job, Sean. You you did. You're a big, tough man, Sean. Okay. But he, <laughs> but he loves that. It's the whole thing where he's like throwing the, the football. He's talking about it. Was it Crot McGrath? Crab McGraw, something like that. That sounds like a Hanna-Barbera villain. Yeah, no, it's like a Israeli hand-to-hand combat oh. or something. I don't know. Oh anyway, yeah, right. Yeah, because I'm not a manly man. I can't tell you uh, anything. Well, about that. I've, listen. What what a conversation this is. Now that we're talking about Sean Hannity doing his little MMA play, he has like Dana White on from UFC, and he's like, Dana, you've seen me before, and Dana's like, ugh. Right. And by the way, the answer to my question, I think, is no, it doesn't matter if it's like some big, tough, you know, Hulk Hogan kind of guy, you know, insisting that it is. But it does add add to the comedy, I think. Right. When you have a guy like Tucker, who is this doughy, you know, uh, Mozart laughing kind of guy, you know, it doesn't represent anything of what he's espousing. No, not at all. I mean, Tucker is really pathetic. And I mean, like, even watching him, you've seen these clips and these pictures of him, like, in his main small town where he's wearing, like, a plaid shirt that he just got, you know, out of a package and he tucks it into his, like, khakis and he's walking around. Like, it's it's total posturing. I mean, all these people are incredibly weak and soft. And that's the essence of this masculine thing, which is the idea that men, who, by the way, are terrified all the time and insecure all the time, that they need to go ahead and revitalize themselves and become strong again. This idea that America and the world has become feminized and weak. But actually, it's just a matter of, of weakness. I mean, you have someone like a Josh Howley, and, and I'm going to make you play this clip in a second. I mean, Josh Howley's like getting out in front of people at national conservatism conferences and saying, the young men of America are spending too much time. They're, they're under attack and they're they're playing their video games and they're watching their porn. And, and, and that entire thing is the basis of this new movement. We'd be surprised that after years of being told that they are the problem, that their manhood is the problem. More and more men are withdrawing into the enclave of idleness and pornography and video games. I found the comment by one young man to a Wall Street Journal reporter particularly evocative and particularly heartbreaking. He said, I'm sort of waiting for a light to come on so I can figure out what to do next. Um, And that brings us to this interesting article that we were reading in the New York Times, which 
is fascinating because you know I again I always like to go visit you know go to the museum and visit the these different sections you know you can kind of study them in the wild and and here we have you know interviews directly with and it's not just white men but they they chose eight men you know at a certain age who are conservative to air their grievances fascinating it's, it was fascinating I mean what, should we pull some of these things apart I mean I, I don't know yeah you so, know. so this is from a New York Times article uh, the title is wonderful these eight conservative men are making no apologies and you'll actually find that they're making a lot of apologies <laughs> focus group and it starts off because the New York Times absolutely it wants to legitimize conservatism it wants to pretend like there isn't some authoritarian movement that's dangerous in this country because if so, it would have to move left and it would have to get serious about it. So they have to legitimize this thing. Here's the opening paragraph. There was no talk of a stolen election, no conspiracy theories about voter fraud or rants about President Biden's legitimacy. That's not a conservative focus group. That's right. not that, that that has nothing to do with the conservative movement, right? No, no. And in fact, they don't probably know a lot about that stuff, right? They, they've pushed it away. It's gone. It's not in their purview. They don't know about it. It's a, it's a deep seated ignorance that a lot otherwise it's what allows them to hold those views, right? Right. If they really did look at some of those things that you just mentioned, there would be some pause. You know, I mean, some of the guys were talking about how even still they're saying that they're, they were um, praising Trump. Because the, the the other side who was con, who criticizing him are just looking at like sound bites, you know. That's the only reason why they think that Trump is bad is they hear these little weird sound bites about random things. I gotta say, Nick, um, we have spent hours and, and hours and hours. I mean, would you even hazard a guess how many hours we've spent investigating Trumpism at oh, this point? Yeah, it's hundreds. I mean, it's it's up there. I mean, but, you know, we, we didn't look further enough into it to see the problems. And, you know, it, it's funny when you start looking at this because we, we've talked about this with focus groups before. They're absolutely worthless. And they're with a bunch of people who aren't paying attention. And what it opens with this, which is if you can voice your biggest concern about the United States in a single word, what would they be? I'm just going to go through the list. Government spending. Great. Well done, everybody. Inflation. I guess economy okay elitism i mean kind of but all right disgraceful and weak and then and then uh one of the pollsters says why weak and joe of course it's joe says this is not the america i remember growing up in which by the way is the rosetta stone of all of this it's everybody wants the world to be the way it was when they were younger and they can't stand the fact that anything could possibly ever change that is the basis of white male aggrievement right there but the other basis of that is whatever world they think it was when they were younger was not the world they think it was that's the worst oh. part about all of this it's like a built on a complete fallacy from the beginning that's what's so frustrating about all that's why you can't have a discussion because it's just you're they're talking a different language okay i'm gonna and, and listen to this it's it's not even a different language it's like a completely different reality the pollster says how free do you feel to just be yourself in society these days and by the way most <laughs> of them put up a zero <laughs> yeah <laughs> they, they've got no freedom to be themselves okay i'm gonna read a couple of it. robert you're not free to be yourself anymore because of crime. What? If I go out, am I going to be a victim of crime? That's that's a legitimate thing this person said. Uh, Michael says, I live in Orlando and we, when we moved here, it was a beautiful place. Now right down the street, people are stealing stuff, breaking into cars. Michael says, and let's get to the, the root of this thing. It's almost anything. You can't mention Trump. You can't mention Biden. Joe says, I feel that social media destroyed a lot of the culture that we had. Things used to be private. Yeah, right. Like how you treated your family and what you said and your racism and your sexism. Christopher says, I'm one of those people that speaks out against cancel culture. And by the way, if somebody declares themselves somebody who speaks out against cancel culture, I just kind of I like to do one of these. I like to put my hands behind my head. I like to put my feet up, just stretch and get comfortable. Ah, <laughs> Christopher says, I think that true patriotism is recognizing that regardless of what party you're in, we're all Americans, and we should start from that premise. Then we find more reasons to join together rather than find silly reasons to fight against each other. Silly reasons. Hey, that's not a bad sentiment. We're all Americans here. This is like stripes, right? We're all we're Americans. We're 10 and 1, whatever. Now we're not even 10 and 1. Um, 
you know, so I, I don't I don't want to push back too hardly on that because that, that is nice, right? Like, you know, w- let's start from that premise. Yeah, but what are those silly things? Oh, <laughs> or what, what are, are the, the things? Silly, yeah, what are the silly things that divide us? Or, or, or what are the things that he wants to do that that he would that he feels like he can't do anymore? You know, that's the other interesting thing. What? Right, right. Know. And 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 on that note, I'm going to read this thing from Danny. Danny says, "I've been a realtor for 22 years. First of all, that's a long time <laughs> to be a realtor. That 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 sounds like a lot." I've lived in Orlando for 44 years. I have a pretty damn good reputation. I'm not being arrogant. Well, sounds like you are a little bit, but that's okay. About a year and a half ago, I was the president of one of the homeowners associations in our community. An Asian woman got into an argument with us. I'm glad he mentioned that she's Asian. That's great. That helps with this whole thing. I'm glad he decided to say that. When I say us, I mean the whole board. That night, she went and wrote a review on my business page saying that I'm a racist. Uh, She wrote a nasty review, and Google won't take it down, even though she wasn't a client of mine. She never even bought a house for me. She never did business with me. She said that I'm a racist. That's what's happening today. And I got to say something, Nick. Maybe she did say that. What's the consequence of it? Like, did he lose his job? Has he lost his entire fortune? Is he living like in a, in, a, in a pariah community? What happened? It's the fear that they're going to get called out for bad behavior. I think this is the same guy who was complaining about all the cars break being broken into, right, in Orlando. Um, do, do you want to hazard a guess? Uh, did cars get broken into like 20 years ago in Orlando? You think? Uh, never. Never? Not, not one? Not okay. a one. Just checking. Just Dick, wondering. People didn't even lock their doors at night. God, can you believe that? In that manufactured city that only exists because of Disney. <laughs> right. And now it's like the purge. I, I mean, they must view it like the purge or want to go to the purge at some point. We've talked about this recently. The mindset that they have is so ludicrously like hyper simulated of what real life is like they they literally go around all day expecting to be canceled attacked for their family to be pulled away by an army thrown into fema camps like it is such like a hyper uh sensitivity in terms of what could possibly happen but it's also manipulated all in the attempt to denigrate the left yes so it just it's almost like they just continue to need an excuse to criticize the left and make all the, you know, whatever they can lash out at because they don't like it. A, a different team. And, you know, if you when you go to another another uh, city's, you know, uh, arena, they yell at you and they boo and they do all that stuff. Well, this is them kind of doing that and they can manipulate these other things to continue to to make them, you know, uh, make them feel better about their positions in a way. Right. Like that's what they're looking for, because that's when crime comes in because it's easy you know it's Biden's fault or the economy is Biden. We got to make sure. Trump got all this, 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 uh, you know, criticism. Well, we got to make sure that Biden gets as much as not more, even if it's not true, you know. And then the, it's easy to pick those subjects. So uh, it's 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 a it's a it's just a terrible place to to have a way to live your life, basically. It's awful. And by, by the way, I listen. I understand that men are having a hard time. I understand that the economy has changed. I understand the expectations have changed. Listen to this, Nick. This is from Joe. Joe. There's a lot of things you really can't talk about. I was mentioning to someone in my office about the president appointing a Supreme Court nominee. It was an African-American woman. I don't know about you. The alarm bells just went off. I can't wait. I, I, I assume that this is going to be a completely rational conversation that a person should be allowed to have in their, their office, right? I will keep going. And I was saying, that's the most racist thing you could do. What if somebody else was good? <laughs> what if it was a Asian, an Asian? What if they were anything? And then when you speak to somebody about it, well, what are you, racist? No, I'm not racist. Don't say that in your office. Don't do that. Stop. Right. Yes, especially if you're talking to an African American woman who has viewed her entire life as a uh, as an oppressed class or an oppressed race, rightfully so, having seen how unbalanced and unfair the entire society it is, and and for the first time having someone that looked like her be nominated to the Supreme Court at, who was um, unbelievably qualified, like yes. It's like this is what they're upset about. They can't express themselves normally, but what are they trying to express? Terrible shit. Terrible. (laughs) By the way, we hadn't even talked about this. Donald Trump, whenever Ginsburg died, said, I'm going to replace her with a woman. 
Were, was, were there riots? Were people overthrowing call? No, it's not about that. It's about this political identity and the fact that they literally want to be able to say anything that they want at any given time, no matter how racist, how sexist, how classist, how xenophobic, without any sort of consequence whatsoever. That's what they want. That's it. That's all this is about. Well, we're the same. We're in the same demographic, basically, as a number of these these guys are. The, 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 I guess the white ones, if you want to do a long race. And yet, like, OK. It's how are you worried about things that you might say, like in the classroom or in out, out in public, uh, that could offend people? Yes, because I don't want to hurt people, right? I mean, and I'm the same but, way, so you could take it two ways. You could say, Great, I want to learn, and I want to make sure I don't offend people, and I'm a, I'm a nicer person, and I treat people normal or well, or you could, I, it's a conscious decision to say, no, I want to say these awful things that are going to hurt people, and it's yes. not my fault if they are hurt by what I say to them directly. That's just, that, maybe that, is that the definition of racism? It's the definition of something negative. I don't know what it is, but it's not good. <laughs> Listen, the entire point here is that these people literally don't want to live in any kind of a society in which there are limitations on what they feel free to say. White, cisgender, straight men have always felt like they can say whatever they want at any given moment. That's the entire thing. I've had people say to me, particularly after my masculinity book came out, they say things like, well, I have to take a second to really think about what I say to people. And it's like, yeah, yeah. That's a good thing. That's what <laughs> everybody else has to do. And it just so happens that now that we don't have industry, now that we're going into information work, now that we're going into offices where you have to share spaces and work with people, it doesn't cut it anymore. You can't do this stuff. Do you get the impression that like, if they do say something bullshit or something horrible and then they're called out on it, that they, they actually might feel bad? And, and, and they're so against feeling bad about themselves. They cannot let that creep in. But I, I, what do you think about that? Like, is there's, there's probably an initial embarrassment. Oh, sh oh God, did I really, did I, did I say something bad? I, whatever. Obviously, it turns to anger and like resentment, and all the other things. But I wonder if there's a moment there where they actually do have that feeling. And then that's really what they're so afraid of is to not have uh, any kind of self-reflection, any kind of, you know, embarrassment feeling that, you know, that they did some, some, something wrong. You know what I mean? I, well, I think it, I think it interferes with their identity. It, it interferes with who they think that they are, right? Which is that they're upstanding people and that they could never harbor something that is, uh, you know, awful or that could potentially be seen as offensive. Uh, all of this is basically this, this existential fear. And on top of that, that they might be, quote unquote, canceled, that they might lose what they have. They might lose their jobs. They might lose their privilege, their affluence. And, and all of this stuff sort of like comes together in like this white hot fear. Well, you know, for a long time in America and society, if you did something really bad and, you, you know, you're plastered on the, on the cover of every magazine is bad, whatever, you would come out and say, gosh, I'm really sorry. You go to rehab, you do all these different things. There's like a game that you played. And then when you came out of that, everyone, they welcomed you back and everything was fine. And at some point, it doesn't it feel like what they think is if you say you're sorry, that's weak and we right. cannot be weak. So I can never, I mean, by the way, this is the Trump doctrine, I guess. And I don't know if it's that, it seems like it's been That's right. before that. But right, this is the other issue is they can't say they're sorry. They can't acknowledge that there are anything wrong because that's weakness. And we can never have weakness no matter what. Like, where is that being taught? Because I don't think it's in the schools. No, it's not. It's being taught by exactly what you just said. Before Trump came along, basically sort of liberal society was teaching people, you have to treat people better. You can't say these things. You have to watch what you say and be considerate of others and at least tolerant. And Trump blew that door wide open. He came along and made it a political and social identity that you can just say whatever you want and actually revel in it. And, and to be honest, like we've talked about this before, Donald Trump is a weak weak, like just sad man. Like there's nothing quote unquote masculine about him outside of his attitude, but he's constantly getting hurt. He's constantly getting upset, which I think a lot of these men really relate to because deep, deep down masculinity is about overcompensation, about insecurity. But he was able to create this public persona where it's like, no, you're not weak. Like, uh, 
He even said this about the military. It's been feminized. It's become weak, right? The idea that America had somehow or another moved over away from masculinity into uh, femininity. And that's what these people are now getting into. And it's going to turn into a very aggressive reactionary uh, movement. And, and that's what we're seeing take form right now. And it used to be like you'd see people who served in the military then run for office. Uh, and there was a bit of a... Um what was it? You get a little shine from that. That was a good thing. John F. Kennedy, like even way back in the day, these war heroes would come back and then serve uh, John McCain. But um, I wonder if now that's going to be bastardized to just sort of, you know, mean, you know, masculinity and toughness. And, you know, we're going to just kick ass and, you know, take names and, you know, we'll figure out the whole democracy thing later. I mean, you know, that has to be one of the reasons why a guy like, you know, Josh Hawley, could get elected is because he was yep. he's sort of talking about his service and then you know Dan Crenshaw some of these guys really feel like yep. that that's what their claim to fame is and it works that that's what's scary is it works and where they are where they're running yeah and listen I want I want to talk about the absolute absurdity of this so two things one the person asked like who is your ideal role model of masculinity they say Jason Statham. Denzel Washington and Tom Brady. Jason Statham is paid to fight people on movie screens, choreographed fights. Denzel Washington seems cool as shit, but he's also a movie star. That's how you know him. Tom Brady? Tom Brady? Do you know how pampered Tom Brady is? I mean, my lord, this person is not their idea of masculinity, but it's all popular culture. Now let's go ahead and move down here a little bit. All of a sudden, they're asking about feminism and, and, and what is happening with masculinity. I'm going to read this thing from Danny. I'm going to read this, Nick. Let it wash over you. Are you ready? I'm ready. Danny says, look at fashion. Look at the newer generation of how people dress, how men dress. There's men and there's women and there's masculinity and femininity, which, by the way, none of that is true, but that's neither here nor there. And there's no reason to destroy one in order to make the other one better. I'm not trying to get into a negative men versus women thing, but I'm seeing masculinity under attack. And I'm seeing men wearing tight skinny jeans with no socks and velvet shoes. And it's cool to wear pink. I don't mind wearing pink. It's a cool color. And I'm not saying colors belong with a certain gender. It's so funny. This is what we were talking about earlier. Every time you speak, you don't feel comfortable enough to say what's on your mind. Or you have to almost give a disclaimer. I have no problem with, with pink. But when we go out to a club or dinner or dancing, you see some of the younger generation wearing very feminine clothes blatantly feminine clothes that is a hot mess of straight garbage nick again don't you think you've seen people wear skinny jeans like a hundred years ago <laughs> like that's the thing they're trying to make it right he's trying to make it seem like I it's know. new it's a new thing that i'm seeing but again this also goes in like the whole gay marriage thing. What could possibly bother you living in your house, but someone who's in another city is doing, you know, to, to expound their love to somebody else? How does that possibly affect you? How would it affect you if you're out at a club or at a restaurant and you see somebody else dressed the way you don't like them in a certain fashion? How is that a thing that you'd be worthy of talking to the New York Times about? I know! <laughs> like, these kids in their fancy shoes. What? Velvet, no socks, Jared. Can you imagine the blisters they've got on those feet? Oh, it's terrible. I gotta. Get, I want to hold them down and put socks on them right now. I mean, what the? F this is insane. It's insane. I'm worried. That guy's a serial killer. I think. That's, that's insane. Patrick Healy, a show of hands question. Do you think sexism is a major problem in America today? Nobody raises a hand. And do you think racism is a major problem in America today? Nobody raises a hand. It's literally identity politics. It's a bunch of men who feel like the world is out to give them, get them, that things have shifted. It's aggrievement politics. That's all that this is. It's about a cloistered group of people who not only feel aggrievement and as if they are under attack, they've got an entire political party and a, uh, a demagogue and a group of demagogues who tell them, you are under attack. Come vote for us. That's all this is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'd like to know like what these people look like that he is seeing dressed strange because I have a feeling that there might be a common thread there appearance wise. Um, but either way, if you want to argue, like I'm trying to run this through my head right now in terms of like the masculinity thing. It's like, yes, I can't afford to look non-masculine or to look weak. And if I accept anybody else who I think is not you know, tough, then they, then I, then that makes me weak. 
in yes. a way, right? In a way. And meanwhile, I can tell you there are people that dress the way he's describing that could probably take on 10 guys at once and kick the living shit out of all of them. You know what I mean? Like, we have every kind of person in this country. And meanwhile, and by the way, would that be the movie version where he discovers this? He gets he goes to beat somebody up who's like, oh, look how he's dressed, whatever. And that person just destroys him and then buys him a beer afterwards. It's got nothing at all to do with anything. The color <laughs> pink, Nick. Whether or not a person wears socks with their shoes, what type of pants that they wear. By the way, everything that I just described is consumerism. Mm -hmm. It's literally what is being sold to you, this identity that's being sold to you, which is what this is all about. It's about living through products and creating a character that goes out in the world. The difference is that like people like you and I can sit here and start to like dissect it and understand where it comes from. And other people are like, what do you mean? It's not real. Of course it's real. And like they get so mad and they get so angry at the idea that any of this is a construct because they are so lost in the construct. They could never possibly move outside of it. And it makes them angry and it makes them violent and it makes them capable of violence. And what we're talking about here today, man, it's really funny what the Tucker video was. And this, this focus group is absolutely absurd. This is the base level foundation of authoritarianism. That's what it is. Authoritarianism relies on aggrieved men who feel like they have to recapture their masculinity. And then, of course, an authoritarian party or demagogue who tells them we can do that. You know, it's weird to me because the way I process things and the way I learn things, like even from an academic standpoint, um, how do these people learn anything? Like, I can't understand, you know, because to me, it's like I'm open, I'm listening, I'm taking in information and I can assimilate it and learn it and they put it in my brain. And I just, I can't believe, I don't know what process they must go through to do that because it seems like so little gets through uh, in, in terms of these things that like, how else would he learn math at this point? I, it's very strange to me. <laughs> well, I it's funny you say that. that because the governor of Florida has now banned a bunch of math books because they contain uh, critical race theory. And quite frankly, let's just be straight up about this. These people aren't fans of book learning. And by that, <laughs> I don't mean that they're stupid. I really don't mean that they're stupid. I mean that they resent the idea that anybody has information that they don't already know. Donald Trump gave us a wonderful view of that. He hated experts. He didn't need to talk to epidemiologists whenever the pandemic was hitting. He knew everything. Remember what he said? My uncle was a scientist. Everybody's very surprised by how quickly I understand this stuff. That's the whole point is these people... They, they're not willing to even admit a momentary thing of weakness. Maybe they don't know something. Maybe they don't understand something. Because any of that, that makes the Jenga tower fall. You know what I mean? It takes one piece and suddenly this whole thing comes down because masculinity is so inherently, like, just unbelievably brittle. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't get it. Never did get it. And, um, and we're doomed. Well, Nick, I don't know what to tell you. I thought maybe we would go and uh, get that that sunning treatment together, but I'll, uh, oh, I'll cancel the couple's treatment. No, I'll go do. I want some more testosterone. I'll do whatever it takes. We'll just know. go on a mountaintop and spread our hands out and look off into the distance. I have no problem doing that, Jared. Any, just tell, name the place and time. I love it. I love it. Well, we are going to go and talk with Max Berger of a more perfect union, and we will be right back. All right, everybody, we are here uh, with a guest, uh, a long, long time coming. I've, I've wanted Max Berger to be on here. Uh, Max is on the editorial staff at More Perfect uh, Union, uh, previously with Justice Dims, uh, Elizabeth Warren, Corn Bo Corey Bush, uh, co-founder of ifnotnow.org. Uh, Max, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So, um, you know, one of the things that I've been keeping track of, and, and I know that you have as well, is... Um, it, it, it feels like labor right now is is having a moment. And by mm -hmm. a moment, I mean, it's lifting itself up out of like the dying embers. <laughs> that it, yes, exactly. That has been absolutely tamped out intentionally and systematically. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you are seeing in your work and how you're feeling about this, because it certainly seems with everything from Amazon, Starbucks, and some of these other uh, challenges that we're seeing around the country. How, what, what's the sense that you're getting from this? Yeah, I think, you know, last year, there was this very uh, strange and contradictory kind of set of data that we got, which on the one hand was that we had this historically tight labor market, we had, you know, workers reporting incredibly high levels of frustration and, uh, you know, high um, 
kind of uh, turnover, right? Like the great resignation, which was really people switching jobs. And somehow at the end of the year, when they showed the data for uh, organizing, uh, it was not looking like there were really new unions being formed. And I think what we're seeing this year is sort of the lag um, in that data where now people are actually out organizing. Um, and it, it, it took a little bit of time for kind of the uh, frustration that people were feeling over the course of the pandemic to begin to translate into this upsurge of labor activity. And I would suspect at the end of this year that we're going to see like a really different set of data. Um, and as you mentioned, the the, the fights at, at Starbucks and Amazon are just absolutely transformational in terms of their potential and what they could mean for working people. Um, you know, I, I saw a, a great take the other day that somebody was talking about how essentially every um, you know, service outlet in, in the country in a major metropolitan area right now, you know, any, any kind of, um, you know, fast food, any kind of like local retail or, you know, um, national retail outlets, like anything that, you know, working people have been suffering at in terms of their conditions for a very long time is now what in labor speak, they refer to as a hot shop right now is, um, organizable in a way that if you were to call an election, you'd have a decent chance of winning, which is just an unprecedented level of support for, for, for joining a union in terms of the last, certainly the last 40 years. Um, and I think we're, we're at this moment in our history where capital has spent the last, you know, 40, 50 years just systematically crushing labor institutionally and taking as much as they can from working people. And so people are just, they've had it, they're up against the wall. Um, and we're in this kind of tight labor market, thanks to the fact that the Biden administration is running the economy pretty hot. And so structurally the, you know, all the, all the conditions are there. And so we're starting to see people take this incredible leadership and for it to really catch on. And, um, you know, I think in the U S one of the biggest obstacles to labor organizing is, uh, the law. Right. Like for for a long time, you know, if you ask people, would you like to join a union? A lot of people would say yes. Even a majority of people would say yes. And yet the private sector is only eight percent unionized. So what we're seeing now, I think, is not just, um, you know, there's this enormous organic demand for labor, for people joining unions. But the Biden administration has been, I would say, you know, and I'm more than happy to, to, to criticize them across the board or, you know, on the issues where they've been coming up short, which, you know, there, there are plenty, but when it comes to labor and um, specifically the NLRB, they've been very, very good. Um, and so I think workers are in a pretty favorable environment. And the fact that there are now these examples, you know, courage is contagious, uh, solidarity is contagious. So I would expect that people are looking at what's happening in Amazon and at Starbucks and saying, hey, like, we can do this too. Um, so I think that that will, that will continue to spread. And it's really just a question of, um, you know, how hard corporate America is going to come down on them and whether the Biden administration can, can have their backs to the extent that they need to. Yeah. And I'm glad you were, you were talking about the idea of courage because I, I, a lot of our discourse in this country gets very, very compressed down and just becomes very, very thin. And the idea is, well, if people wanted a union, they would form a union. And as a result, they don't want unions. I was wondering right. if you could talk about the absolutely oppressive system of trying to crush these efforts. I mean, the reason I think people like us are very excited about what has happened with Amazon and Starbucks is because these are monolithic corporations, massive, yeah. uh, almost limitless resources that mm -hmm. they have been using to try and destroy any sort of nascent labor movement, the amount of money, the time, the energy. I mean, there's people might not know this, there are entire industries of anti-union uh, people who come in, advise you how to take this stuff over. Uh, a lot of them, by the way, are parts of things like the Democratic Party. I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's a really insidious sort of a movement that happens. I was wondering if you could talk about like how big of a triumph this is in the face of like massive overwhelming resources and power. 
Yeah, yeah. It's you know, it's always a little tricky talking about this stuff because there's some part of you that wants to in explaining how big of a deal it is to overcome all these obstacles. Like I, I'm always a little scared to be like, it's really it's a lot hard to form. <laughs> it's really, really, you know, I, you know, it's like almost illegal to form a union. And I don't think that people who have ever tried to do it or been a part of it necessarily have as clear of a sense of all the obstacles that go into it. But the biggest thing is that on, on the enforcement side, anything that's, um, that the employer is banned from doing right. All, all the things that if you were an employer and you wanted to crush a union that you would think about doing, you want to fire workers, you want to threaten people, you want to intimidate people. You want to tell them that you could shut down the company, all those things. The enforcement is so minute that even if, you know, the, the, the company is found guilty of breaking the law and doing every single possible thing they can to crush the union, that's essentially priced in to them deciding to do it. The, the fines are minuscule, you know, compared to the scope of what's at stake in a labor in, in, in the labor fight. And so from the corporate corporation's perspective, they're like, sure, we're going to hire these lawyers. We're going to come in and they're going to run these captive meeting, captive audience meetings where we're going to tell, you know, we're going to present our case in the election. And what they do in these meetings and in all kinds of other ways in the work site is remind the workers that if they unionize, that something, maybe everything is at risk, right? And it's very scary if you uh, haven't been through it before. I mean, I think it's scary even for people who have been, been through it before. Um, and so workers feel incredibly disempowered. They feel scared. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, a lot of these, so, so some of these firms, not all, some of them are very specialized in um, labor management, right, who are come in and get paid, you know, exorbitant amounts of money to uh, suppress the union. And they have very sophisticated tactics at this point, because they've been doing it for a long time. So, you know, they, they, they will help you come up with the materials, do the training, you know, put stuff around the work site, like figure out how to communicate with the workers, all this stuff. And, you know, in certain instances, like at uh, Amazon, you, you see uh, kind of top people from those union suppression firms being hired internally to basically the HR department so that they have their own internal union busting team at some of these big corporations. Like you said, the, you know, limitless resources, they just throw everything they can at the problem and you have those people go out and you visit the work site and do all the things that they can do to scare people. Um, and in other instances, you know, some of those same big firms, for example, we just saw Global Strategy Group, um, which is a major consulting group that does a lot of work with corporations and also big Democratic Party entities was uh, revealed to have done some union suppression stuff for uh, for Amazon. So some of these firms are definitely kind of playing both sides of the aisle. And it's really gross that Democratic Party candidates and candidate, uh, excuse me, uh, committees, you know, are willing to work with folks who are who are suppressing labor unions, but it, it, that really just puts in some form of context just how incredible of a victory it was. In particular, that they won uh, in Amazon at, in Staten Island because not only were they taking on the largest corporation in the world, uh, or sorry, sorry, largest corporation in the country, but uh, they were also taking on that company essentially by themselves because they didn't even have the support of like a formal labor union. Uh, they were independent. So, the, you know, it's, 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 it, I don't know if it, it, it's like, I don't know if you're a premier league fan, but it's like they pulled a Lester, but like the year after getting promoted or something, like, it's like, I don't know how to explain. It's like, this is an absolutely incredible. It's a number 16 seed won the NCAAs. Like, it's like, this just doesn't happen. Like it's, it's like a pickup team coming in and beating the 96 bulls. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's like just the kind of thing that you, it, the, any of the examples you would use sound preposterous. It's like, yes, that is exactly what happened. Um, but I think it also goes to show that, you know, like if we're in a scenario where working people are just absolutely unwilling to accept these conditions that there's only so much the corporations can do, you know? So I think that that's, that that's a pretty optimistic place for us to be. Yeah. And I'm glad you said it that way. And we were talking a little bit before we started recording about this. Um, you know, the, the entire dominance of labor relies on people feeling powerless 
and mm-hmm. feeling alone. I mean, I, I I don't think people really understand necessarily like how much alienation uh, mm-hmm. really figures into this, making sure that people aren't talking about how much money they're making, uh, what yeah. agreements they've made. Uh, I mean, it's been a godsend for so many corporations having people work at home, not even being in the same space together. Yeah. Um, and, and what happens is the veneer, which is a very, very thin veneer, cracks. And the mm-hmm. moment that people are just like, I am literally tired of this shit. I don't care if I get fired. I will walk away from the job. All of a sudden, that, that momentum and power changes. I was wondering if you could talk about like not just how optimistic this, this makes you feel, but how, how you see that this is the possible alternative. Because we're going to have to talk about fascism and authoritarianism here in just yeah. a second. But yeah, yeah. I, I was hoping you could talk about that a little bit. Well, yeah, no, I mean, and I appreciate this. I know that this is something that you talk about a lot and write about a lot, but I think that, uh, you know, the American ideology of individualism and the way that that then forces people, causes people to internalize their suffering as a result of their own failures and limitations and not, you know, the result of a crushing, you know, capitalist oligarchic system that exploits them and um, takes advantage of them and keeps them from supporting each other and having the basic things that they need to thrive. You know, it's in the United States is one of our biggest obstacles to forming any of the kinds of solutions that are going to be necessary in terms of labor or in terms of authoritarianism. Obviously, those things are deeply, deeply intertwined. But, you know, I think part of what is interesting about this present moment, and I think it is also very generational. I don't want to solely, you know, kind of define it in those terms, but I do think that, you know, for for folks who are under 40, under 35, this notion that the institutions that we grew up in basically work and that if there's something going wrong, that it's like our fault and we didn't do something right, just is not, that is not, no one thinks that. You know? It's preposterous. That, it's a ridiculous thing. Yeah. So, and I think that that's, that really does change the context that organizing is happening within right because you start to then understand okay my shit is my life is really fucked up right now right like i am i can barely you know i i I can barely pay the bills i can barely put food on the table you know i either went to school or didn't get to go to school and it didn't result in things that i needed to or i you know don't even have those opportunities to begin with and you really come out of that thinking okay something really needs to change and i think for a lot of people that is now starting at um, at work because we've tried at the ballot box and not to say that those efforts aren't important or won't continue to be important, but we've seen that that's you know only one kind of terrain of struggle. And so I think there are millions of people who understand that the reason that their lives have been as hard as they are is because they were put in a position where they were, don't really have a chance to succeed. And that the only way to change that is by getting together with all the other people who were put in that same situation, which is most of us, you know, close, close to all of us. <laughs> and, and to decide that we, we're going to come together and we're going to change things. And that that doesn't mean we're just going to go out to the ballot box every two or four years, but that we're going to stand together with the people in our workplace who are also being exploited, who are also suffering and build a union, you know, to, to change things from, from where we are. And I think that that's a very hard thing to put back in the bottle. You know, I don't want to be overly optimistic because this stuff does take a lot of time and we are up against a lot of structural institutional barriers, but I think I'm in this moment right now that probably a lot of people can relate to, but, you know, and I think there's a, the Gramsci metaphor of the interregnum really does a lot here where it, it, when it comes to the spirit of the people and sort of the, the the forms of consciousness that are forming, I am just incredibly optimistic, more so than I ever have been in my life. I'm just like, wow, people are really sick of this shit, <laughs> you know, and like really, really want things to change. And I think are um, really thirsty for genuine connection and solidarity, which is not something that a lot of Americans have ever really experienced, you know, like historically. And I think Bernie's campaign and, and social movements that have happened over the last five or 10 years have also given people some taste of what it means to be a part of a collective, uh, you know, some form of collective action and have some collective agency so that these problems and these challenges that you're facing could potentially change through your participation in this mass entity. So people are like, oh, I want more of that. We need more of that. Those are the ways that we're going to get out of this. And then you start to look at the institutions that were operating within institutional arrangement, arrangements, both in terms of law, in terms of politics, in terms of our economy. And 
it feels a lot less optimistic. <laughs> you know, there's the extent of the barriers that we're up against um, are, are pretty huge, especially in this country. And so we just have to build a wave high enough to crash over them. And, um, you know, I, I can make, I, depending on who I'm talking to and what hour of the day it is, I, I will either lean into making the, the optimistic case or the pessimistic case, because I think they're both, uh, they're both pretty valid. <laughs> I, I think you and I are alike in that regard. I, I listen, I understand a lot of my, uh, my corners being a prophet of doom. Like I get <laughs> it and, and chronicling what power and all this does. But I have to tell you, for me, I look at the systems of neoliberalism, everything is stacked on the mm. other side of the deck. I mean, and literally everything is, I mean, government is completely controlled by capital at this point. Mm. Uh, basically every, um, every system at this point is just completely for crushing labor unions. I mean, that is, that's the original founding idea of neoliberalism, the, the, the ordering system of the world. But for people to still say, you know what, damn it, I deserve better. I, I, I think that's like miraculous. I really do. And I find that, mm. I find that inspiring on a daily basis. Totally. And I think that we're at this point now where the systems are transparently failing and so are uh, delegitimizing themselves. And so they're kind of zombie systems. Yep. There's a leftist political party in Spain that my friends and I have long been fans of called Podemos, um, which comes out of the anti-austerity movement of 2011. And uh, they have a, a saying basically like, you know, the, the, the rulers uh, govern, but do they, they do not convince, right? Like the, the, the people in charge right now, and I think that this is, uh, you know, where, where a lot of the desire, the demand, the organic demand for fascism comes from, right, is like a, is a pervasive sense that the institutions of liberal democracy and capitalism are failing. And so people are just inherently attracted to anti-systemic orientations that aim to sweep aside the entire order and uh, th those the, the the rise in the organic demand for some form of fascist politics is in itself a indication an example of the crisis and the failure of neoliberalism. And so it's really just a question of can we constitute enough popular power to transform these systems towards more democratic, egalitarian, and and you know socialist means of. Uh, representation and distribution of resources because the, the, the systems themselves don't work. And now most people recognize that. So it's just uh, a battle for who takes, who takes control of the vacuum. And, you know, there's a lot of debate these days about like, is neoliberalism dead? Cause it still seems like it's kind of, um, you know, it, it, it is the, the operating order. And I think that's true, right? I don't want to make it sound like that has changed, but I think that uh, its ability to convince both elites and the public of its viability is pretty severely crippled. So it's, it, it is kind of the zombie system that I think is likely to be, be replaced within the next 10 years. And I think that's both what's so exciting and both then so terrifying because it could just as easily be, you know, fossil fuel fueled, uh, fascist authoritarian dictators around the world stepping into that void and creating a new model uh, or it can be you know green social democracy basically and i don't think that i don't think that the macronist bidenist you know kind of restore re restorationist you know kind of allowing uh, um, neoliberalism to live on has a future as a as the governing philosophy across the globe. I don't think that at least not with a smiling human face. I think that's the thing about neoliberalism is it for the past few decades and and I think Trump was one of the reasons why I always say it's like driving for hours at a time and forgetting that you're driving and then waking mm -hmm. up and realizing I'm like behind the wheel of a speeding automobile, you know, mm -hmm. like Trump was the moment I think people had to wake up and they were like, oh, a lot of the smiling veneer that we've had this, you know, saying the right things about caring for people and wanting to lift people up that not only was that bullshit, but that hid like a really like inherently fascistic system. Oh, and yeah. I think and, and what I'm really concerned about is that we are leading up to a crossroads. And I'm with you. I think there's a real opportunity for some sort of a uh, democratic movement, some sort of a revitalization of uh, the individual and mass politics. But 
I think neoliberalism has a hidden sort of move, which is they love authoritarians. And right. if, if people, because it used to be go to work and you'll be able to afford the car, the, you'll have the kids, you'll have the house, you'll have all those. That's the deal. You put in your work, you put in your time, you live the quote unquote American dream. That's gone. And so now there's nothing that makes people want to go to work outside of fear of, you know, houselessness or abject poverty or suffering. Eventually, somehow or another, they have to sanctify the system again. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, where you see a lot of these national conservatives talking about right. renewal of Christian nationalism or basically just making sure that people go in or they get their skulls crushed. It feels like it's sort of a divider time. And we're going to see that sort of come into uh, come into view. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think that there's there's like a lot of overlap between neoliberalism and authoritarianism. Obviously, there's the history in Chile and other places, but yeah, I think the, the there there's this choice that happens, and I I think we can talk about this theoretically, but it's also really clear when you talk about it in terms of actually you know discrete choices made by specific institutions, right? But like the the way I've always thought about it is just that the alliance between the the kind of corporate America would rather lead. Right. And have have their agenda be the dominant part of the kind of right of center political coalition and um, have the racist, you know, national authoritarians as the we, we understand that that's sub rosa all the time and actually what generates most of our mass appeal. But we'd like to, like, keep it a little bit subtextual. And what has happened over the course of the last five or 10 years is like that, that 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 has been inverted. Right. So like that, the, 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 the fascists are more out front now and they don't have an organic, the, the neoliberal, the neoliberal qua neoliberals are not, don't have an organic base. Right. Like there's no one who's following the chamber of commerce. No very possible. small group of people. Very, very small. And the chamber of commerce is really interesting because that's what I was saying about the discrete thing. Like they have, you know, threatened to pull all of their funding from any candidate who voted uh, who, who would who would have voted for Build Back Better, right? But they have uh, resumed funding for the Republicans who were supportive of the insurrection, yeah. right? So business, the 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 institution that represents the interests of business and politics, the foremost institution, has decided that social democracy is more, you know, small baby step in the direction of social democracy is more threatening than trying to overthrow the government. And so it's just one of these clear choice points where, okay, I, I don't know if capital is inherently fascistic, necessarily fascistic, but their support for neoliberalism has led to this crisis of legitimacy. And when given the choice between giving up a small amount of their wealth and power or siding with the overt fascists, it's they've not made, much of a choice. They stand, they've made clear where they'd stand, you know, and the, the, the more theoretically inclined people would say that that's that there's something inevitable or inexorable about that or that that's inherent in neoliberalism. I don't know. I just know that historically that's where we're at and that that, that choice is is before us and that's what they're choosing. So I wanted to read a, a tweet uh, that you wrote, which I think is very succinct and dead on. It is, if Republicans take power in 2025 and move us more dramatically towards authoritarianism, it will be due in part to the timidity and corruption of Democrats who failed to stop them. I, I think that's 100% correct. I think it's undeniable. Uh, we have reached a point where we're now looking at the November midterms. Uh, the Democratic Party, for the most part, has no explanation for why the uh, Biden agenda has stalled. It has um, really no desire to talk about the fact that Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are there as uh, vetoes for corporate entrenched power in Washington, D.C. Um, there is a real, like you say, timidity to even talk about what's happening within the Republican Party. I was wondering if you could talk about where you see that coming from, what you think it is, and if you see any kind of movement out of this, because I got to tell you, there was a really good op-ed today by Elizabeth Warren, who, um, and, and, and this is just a quick out of context quote, but for anybody who knows what's going on, th these are shots fired. She called out out of touch consultants. Which in the democratic world is uh, that that's, yeah, that's, that's some big, yeah. that's some heavy pipe swinging. I'll just yeah, say exactly. Um, yeah, I'm I'm happy to talk about that. Um, I, so after the 2016 election, this is a little bit of a I, 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 I'm getting there. I promise. But uh, <laughs> I, after the 2016 election, I met up with a friend who has spent a lot of time working in 
what scholars refer to as kind of backsliding authoritarian regimes, right? Like countries that were more democratic that have since become more authoritarian. Um, and one of the things he said to me was, you know, when you go and you talk to the opposition politicians in a lot of these countries, uh, it's really scary because, you know, they think that they're just going to be back in power in the next election, that they don't realize that the game has really fundamentally changed, that it's no longer kind of the rules of the game that we understand under, under democracy. And a big part of the reason that the authoritarian was able to rise was because the opposition party was pretty corrupt and not very functional. Um, and so they really can't do a great job of mounting an opposition once the authoritarian rises because they weren't do, re, doing a great job before. And I think about that quote all the time <laughs> because I think you know that really does represent a lot of where the Democratic Party is and has been. And you know, another anecdote that I think explains a lot of this is in 2016 after uh, Trump's election. I think the following night, I somehow got snuck in through a friend of a friend to a big donor political confab. I'd never been to one of these things before, but it was fascinating. Nancy Pelosi was there, uh, Chuck Schumer was there, and they were trying to kind of you know, get people to feel less depressed. And I'll, I'll never forget, Chuck Schumer was like, you know, we got it wrong. Uh, Trump was a bit more serious than we thought. And he, you know, he was, he, he said some stuff about trade that we, we, we probably could have been better on. And when it comes to stuff that he's right about, we'll work with him. And when it comes to stuff that he's wrong about, we'll try to fight him. And, you know, hopefully we'll get him next time. And I just remember thinking, this man has no idea. What the hell just happened? He has completely no, different planet. No idea. So I think, you know, there, there's part of me that's inclined to give a more structural explanation to like as a voter, as an American, as a person, as a Democrat, I, I do feel like it's worth mentioning the extent to which individual people, classes of people are very corrupt that, you know, the, and I think in some ways, the biggest bias is um, for 40 years, the people who have been in power have been operating under neoliberalism and so are used to losing or playing on their opponent's terrain. And I think you see this, especially with people like Nancy Pelosi, who otherwise are pretty sharp in certain respects, but really don't understand that sometimes going on the offensive is helpful and good. And I think it's really shocking the extent to which Democrats have abdicated responsibility on some of these basic questions of democratic accountability, accountability where you know, the Ginny Thomas stuff, how slow it took them, it was for them to, um, you know, launch the second impeachment, uh, how bad of a job they're doing prosecuting any of the January 6th stuff, like all this stuff, which isn't even the political economy stuff, right? Like you think there's not, there's not a pro overthrow democracy lobby right like there's you would think that that would be a relatively easy place where they could really press the advantage and go on the offensive and yet they can't and i think it's because they just have such a deeply embedded loser mentality where they have spent the last four years basically playing on their opponent's turf under neoliberalism and so don't know how to win they, they just don't know how can't even think about it the only way that they can think to be is to you know, take this defensive crouch and to try to wait bunker and just wait it out. I, the other explanation that I want to give, though, that I do think is worth saying, it's a bit bloodless, but it doesn't feel sometimes as interesting to people, but I think it's important. It's like, I think we're really also witnessing the collapse of the party system in America, where we, we don't have a functional constitutional design. And you know, it, we are kind of just lucky that it's worked as relatively well as it has for as long as it has. There's other reasons why that's the case. We can, long story, but short answer is I don't think it's going to last that much longer. And so if you if your veto point is the most pro-Trump state in the country and it's a guy who got elected by 270,000 people, like you're going to be totally subjected to the insane whims of that individual. And unfortunately, the National Democratic Party does not really have very much leverage over Joe Manchin. Like Joe Biden does not get to tell Joe Manchin what to do. And there's not really much he can do to force him to do what he wants. Sorry. So, it, you know, it, I don't mean to absolve anybody of guilt. And sometimes when I make the latter argument, people 
hear that I'm saying like, oh, Democrats aren't corrupt or aren't incompetent or aren't weak or pathetic or whatever. I'm like, no, no, they're all that stuff too. But I do think that we'd be living in a very different world in which, you know, Joe Manchin was the 51st, the 51st Democrat. And there, there was potentially a deal to be made on build back better. Like we, this conversation would be a very different conversation. And I, I think that more people need to take seriously the structural argument, which is, it is scary. And I'll just say there are not easy answers for the structural concern, you know, the structural argument f- by liberals or the left, right? Like liberals just want to say, just keep voting, just vote more, just more Democrats and everything is solved. I don't really buy it, right? Certain types of leftists or socialists will tell you, we just need more labor power. The biggest problem is that there isn't more labor power. And I actually am like, no, no, we do need both of those things. Yeah. But actually, that unto itself does not solve the question of having a political system that can't pass laws and really can only it is only designed to, in, to represent the interests of very wealthy people. And um, that has to change. <laughs> so I think at some point, if we're actually going to get out of this, we actually do need some really big political reform to be on the agenda. And more people need to start thinking about how the hell we actually do that. Yeah, and I think uh, to go ahead and wrap this thing up, I, I think whenever the Democratic Party changed, particularly in the 1980s and started moving towards, um, you know, the DLC sort of model, this was after decades of labor being systematically just eradicated. Mm-hmm. And by the time you get to stagflation in the 1970s, that's neoliberalism is already setting in. There's not much of a choice otherwise. And at that point, I mean, you're losing 49 states to Ronald Reagan, you know, that you, you have to have a decision. And as a result, the Democratic Party has been chasing the tail of the Republican Party pretty much ever since. Yeah. And I, for me, and I would love to hear what you have to say about it, 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 it comes down to not just labor needing to be resurgent in order to put pressure on the Democratic Party to look at them at a constituency again, as opposed to mm-hmm. the, uh, the random centrist voter in what, Dayton, Ohio, a white right. voter who's terrified about civil rights, right? But you also need some sort of, I think, a grassroots anti-corruption, pro-democracy reform movement. And I think when you bring those three things together and all those pressures sort of counterbalance, I think I think that's sort of the solution. I mean, that's a tall order. That's a, that's a really stiff cocktail, but it feels like that's where it's at. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think that those are the elements. I feel like there's a lot of questions about how that works in practice that we are going to have to figure out over the next 10 or 15 years. And like, there are big questions about strategy too, right? Like, you know, so I I think that's right. And I think what's really difficult for me as somebody who has been, um, you know, if I have found historical analogies helpful to me at different points in history that I'm trying to understand, okay, you know, particularly when we started getting involved with what became justice Democrats, we were very clear about the need for intervention that was around the crisis of neoliberalism, a new alternative, and that we were sort of engaging in the beginning of this 40 year struggle to realign the democratic party back towards working people. And that it was gonna take some time, but that we could take over the party in the same way that the conservative movement took over the Republican party. And that part of that was political and that was what we wanted to be a part of. And that was like a very, maybe oversimplified, but like very clarifying historical analogy that really provided a lot of context for the kind of decisions we needed to make in terms of intervening in that dynamic and building power strategically and thinking about the scale of both institutions and just time that we needed. And what is really confusing to me about what you just said is that I'm like, what the, what historical, and like, you know, Ryan Enos, I believe is a political scientist from Harvard the other day who was it must have been months ago at this point, was trying to figure out what the historical analogy for this moment was. He's like, is it the fall of Rome? Is it 1939? Is it the Gilded Age? Is it, you know, and it's like, yeah, man. All of it. And all those, but so just in terms of, you know, and and, and even on the most basic level, there's a question that I've been starting to grapple with a lot more, which is, you know, engaging with daily politics, engaging in electoral legislative politics, formal politics, I think it's going to continue to be very important, but we're also in this moment where like those institutions themselves are incredibly unrepresentative and really obstacles to change in a way that 
I think has been true of other kind of revolutionary moments throughout history. And I think you see this with the run up to January 6th with, uh, and I, it's hard to explain to people what it's like to have been in these, in this mindset, but it was like, on the one hand, we were dealing with COVID and trying to have a fight about the COVID package. And on the other hand, it was really clear to me and some of my other organizer friends, like they're going to try to overthrow the government. And so you had to simultaneously do parliamentary politics, legislative politics, and kind of extra parliamentary social movement, you know, civil resistance style politics. And I'm like, this is fucking hard to figure out, you know, it's really hard. So I think as we, in the next five or 10 years, that, that type of thinking and having to choose between those different modes of politics is going to only become more prevalent and important. And it's really, I, I like to get on here and, you know, give big pronostications about what I think is going to happen based on some kind of historical analogy. And I'm like, bro, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I couldn't tell you. I could not tell you. Are we, are, I do feel very confident that the Republic that we have right now will not survive the decade. And whether that happens as a result of some form of democratic transformation or as a result of, you know, a more uh, consolidated authoritarianism, I could not, I, I couldn't tell you. But I, Or but a I, decentralized balkanization. Like or, something, yeah, sure. just, or any, you name it, there's so many different- Or anything in between, yeah. But I, but I do feel, I do feel relatively convinced that the center cannot hold and that we need to start preparing for that eventuality in a much more rigorous and strategic way. And as I always say, it's solidarity. You're, you're exactly right with all that. But I mean, it, it doesn't matter what ends up happening one way or another, whether it's forming labor unions or just forming commu communities or just relationships, it's got to be solidarity. Yeah. Or social movements or political parties. Like it doesn't matter. You know, it's all the same. I'm absolutely right. And I think that that cultural stuff does come first. Like people need to feel a connection to each other and a possibility that things could be better. And that's why stuff like this is so important. Absolutely. Max Berger, one of the best that there is. Can you tell the good people where to find you? Uh, I'm on Twitter. You should come check out uh, More Perfect Union at uh, perfectunion.us. Absolutely. Wonderful, wonderful people. Thank you so much, Max. Bye. All right, we are back, and that was Max Berger of the More Perfect Union. Uh, some actually, not just uh, informative stuff in that, but a little bit of optimism in there in terms of where uh, labor unions are going. And I, and I have to tell you, uh, masculine individualism is one of the reasons why uh, forming unions and solidarity is uh, kind of really hard because masculinity has told men that they don't need to rely on others. They can never form those necessary emotional solidarity, intimate bonds. Uh, this stuff goes hand in hand, unfortunately. Right. I mean, although it's a little bit weird because like the Teamsters, you would certainly think were the manly men who, uh, you know, also did that. But now the, I have to say the right probably looks at the Teamsters, too, as being uh, – um, bad, right? Because they're bad yep. for business, right? Even though they do exemplify, you know, the masculinity that they're talking about and looking for. So it's just another dichotomy that they they can't square and then shove down into their brain anyway. Well, Nick, I mean, you know, bringing this into the realm of movies very quickly, this is why the joke of Dr. Strangelove is so funny. The idea that Colonel Ripper is so frightened of the communists taking the manly essence, right? Because the, the entirety of like communist Fear, And that includes labor unions. It includes any democratic movement, any protest movement. It was always communist because the idea was that they were weaker than everybody else. It was this it was this fear that anti masculinity, this femininity was going to come in and take over. And I got to tell you, authoritarianism is absolutely obsessed with this stuff. The idea that manhood is under attack and that collectivism in any way, shape or form is going to come in and just eradicate it and basically do it as, as a matter of basically war on Western civilization. Yeah. And, and they get to their adult lives sort of assuming like if you were going to talk about gender identity, for instance, to uh, a third grader, that that discussion would lead some a kid who hears that to want to change their, their sexual identity. Because well, of the discussion. You, you, you've heard me talk about this before. Like during civil rights, everybody said, you know what, people of color are, are just they're easily manipulatable. Right. They're just so naive and they're not smart enough to understand. So the liberal traders and the communists on the outside are manipulating them and making them march and making them do these things. 
They look at the same thing with like trans people. They say, oh, these people, they don't know what they're doing. They're being led astray by these satanic, demonic powers, these liberal traitors, these outside destroyers. It's the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it, 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 it's the exact same lines. It's the same story. And unfortunately, it's pretty effective. Yeah, there must be some, maybe it's genetic. There's something buried deep in some code or something that the other it causes fear and, and some sort of strange response. I don't have that, and I don't know. I mean, but I, I think I was raised that way. I mean, I think my mom spent a lot of time making sure that we were exposed to all different types of different people for that reason. I suppose in America, you can go, uh, uh, you know, f uh, a long distance in certain areas and not encounter anybody else that doesn't look like you. I, I got to tell you, I am so grateful uh, for my mom and for my grandpa because I got to tell you, Nick, like watching that video, that Tucker Carlson promotional video – like I could have very easily become one of those people that was just like, yeah, take your shirt off and chop down a tree and then go sun your testicles with a machine and that'll do it. And we got to like you're exactly right. It's like the people who put in the work to ensure that we didn't go that direction. It's huge. It actually is huge. It's life saving. It's society saving. Those types of things are things to be very, very grateful for. Absolutely. All right. And we are grateful for you, as always. Uh, you keep this show ad-free, editorially independent, and just trucking along. We couldn't do this without you. Uh, go over to patreon.com slash podcast to uh, become a patron of the show, support the show, but also to gain access to our weekly additional show, The Weekender, which airs on Fridays, including some of our hangouts, the Muckrake community, all that good stuff. That's patreon.com slash podcast. Thank you, everybody. If you need us before then, you can find Nick at Can You Hear Me at SMH. See, got tripped up on that. You got tripped up That's, on it. You know, come on, get masculine, man. I gotta tell you. And you can find me, JY Saxton. All right, everybody, stay safe.